All right, boys, welcome back. I actually wanted to record a quick follow-up video to the last idle video that I made. As soon as I hit stop recording, I'm like, ah, you know what was the perfect thing to talk about, and I totally dropped the ball, was the minimum final spark that we see here and the effect it had on air. Hopefully, though, I gave you enough information that you kind of saw why this worked out the way it did. So this is the same log file that we looked at before. You can see minimum final spark, it's capping off at four degrees positive timing. And then when you look at the idle integral, you can see that it's really pulling out a lot of air because if you think about it, it's trying to reduce the RPMs. It hits a brick wall at four degrees of timing and the only other trick up its sleeve to reduce RPMs is to keep pulling air. And so I thought, well, you know, that's not super interesting, right? Like that's probably not enough to make another video over. But then I got to thinking about it. I'm like, you know what the interesting thing about this histogram is? We kind of have a double hump here, right? Two bell curves. And so what I think is going on, if we look at this, you know, we have one kind of nice bell curve here and then we have this other guy right up here, right? So why is that? And so I started thinking about it and I got a hypothesis and I got a theorem and then I found out a way to test it and then get empirical data and then boom, all of a sudden we have this scientific process, boys. So I thought, you know, what is worth making a video over is testing my theory out. So when we look at this and then we can also see the same thing here in the idle desired error, we still have the same double hump here. So what I think is going on is this first bell curve essentially, I mean, it's not perfect, but I mean, it is what it is as far as bell curves go. This is what is occurring when the RPMs, well, I should say the spark is allowed to do what it wants to do. It's normal operating condition. Then this other spike up here, this represents when it hits the brick wall. And so we kind of have two operating modes. We have the not restricted by the four degrees minimum final spark. And then we have the, I am limited and I have to play with the air. So what I did was if we go into the tune here, um, this is how the minimum final spark was set before, right? And you can see in this area up here, it's all four degrees, right? So what I did was I said, okay, you know, anything above, you know, these grams per second or uh, air mass, I should say grams per cylinder, that's not idle, we will allow it to go all the way back down to negative 15 if it so desires. So then when I get into the log file for that, check this out. <clears throat> we can see the spark while we were capped at four, it really just needed two extra degrees. Not a big deal. And not only that, I let this thing, I don't know how well you can see it, I let this idle for two minutes. The first log was only, you know, one minute and 12 seconds. So. I got quite a bit of data in here, right? And so now we don't have that double hump. It's not a perfect bell curve, but you know, it's not so bad. And so then when we look at the proportional, it's still a really nice bell curve. And the integral that we see is now pretty much, I mean, I don't know if that's Sears Tower or something, but we do not have the double hump, right? We have a very nice tight organization and distribution of our data, it's perfect. And then when we look at the idle desired error, again, nice, perfect bell curve. So super awesome. And for two degrees of timing, I mean, seriously, that's, that's pretty big. That tells you how responsive the engine is and how sensitive it is to the actual timing versus the airflow. So all that is to say, should you ever get involved in a situation where you, you use these graphs and you start seeing that double hump here, um, that probably is an indication that, at least in this example, that you have something going on with the spark. Now this is the minimum final spark, right? So, uh, wait, wrong file. This is the minimum final spark. So there's no upper limit, right? So what you then need to be concerned about when we start looking at this is the over and under speed. So should it go over speed, you can see it's trying to pull out 24 degrees. So if you look at your base spark, 
And so for that, if we look at doo -doo 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 -doo, idle base spark, you can see I've set for 12 degrees. And if we subtract 24, you can see there's this should only conceivably possibly ever hit negative 12 degrees because positive 12 plus negative 24 is going to be negative 12. So make sure also that these are working together. And if you're having problems with the idle and you keep making this even more negative, you know, so like from negative 24 to like negative 36, for instance, and nothing is happening, well, keep in mind that this minimum base spark could be spoiling your fun and not being able to do that. So it all kind of ties in together. Now, the other interesting thing, you know, my camshaft, uh, you know, 230. 233 degrees of intake duration, 112 degree lobe separation, and 19 degrees of overlap. It's a pretty snotty cam, right? I mean, it's it's not a little weak, weak, you know, cam, right? This is for serious street stuff. But you can see I'm only commanding 12 degrees of timing to make this thing idle. And it idles pretty stable. I'm super impressed with it. It works great. When I pull up the OEM file though, check it out. The stock LS3 camshaft, where did it go? The factory is commanding 13 degrees. So even though I have a way bigger cam than the factory LS3, I'm actually commanding one degree less. And so mainly my idle stability is coming through controlling of the airflow. So I hope you got something out of this and explains a little bit more. Oh, you know what? The only other thing I wanted to talk about real quick. I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. If we go back over here to idle RPM and we look at the vehicle speed, this guy here. So everything that I've been telling you so far is related to my car, my setup, my experience, my driving style, my hardware, so on and so forth, right? So my goal is to empower you guys with enough information that you can take what I say and you say, this guy's full of crap. Let's forget everything he ever said. Or, and you know, that's just one other data point I can add and I can combine it with my own and then we'll go from there. Um, and I don't, I don't ever want to say do exactly this, right? My goal is to give you the information so that you can figure it out on yourself for any situation. But I got to thinking about this and, you know, to back up what I'm saying is I helped a guy, I don't know, maybe a year ago, he had a rock crawler. And so, you know what, his whole table, well, I don't remember what his idle speed was, but we'll call it 550. You know, so you think about you're in a rock crawler, you probably are never going to be going over a few miles an hour. But what if you did go over seven and a half miles an hour? and the engine started idling higher. Like you don't want to accidentally roll off of a cliff because your, your idle speed, your rolling idle speed was too high. So in that case, that would be a great reason not to, to change this table or at least maybe change it so it's all the same across the board. All that is to say, you need to think for yourself and just understand I'm attacking this from my car on the street with my cam and converter and my driving style and my expectations from the car. Yours should be totally different. Anyway, I hope you got something out of that. I hope it helps you in the future uh, to propel yourself onwards and upwards and into the winner's circle. So until next time, I will uh, see you later. Bye.